The one word I would use to describe NFG is beloved community. NFG is community. Relationships. I know that a lot of folks uh, long league years call NFG home, their political home. I've heard NFG referred to as a philanthropic political home, and that really resonates with me. I would describe NFG as community. I would describe NFG as connection. I would describe NFG as family. I would describe NFG as power. I would describe NFG as strategy space. NFG is relational. The word I would use is haven. I call uh, NFG uh, a set of co-conspirators for justice. My name is Adriana Rocha. I'm president of Neighborhood Funders Group. I'm Mary Sebecki. I'm the executive director of the Need More Fund based in Toledo, Ohio. I'm currently serving with NFG on the board and I'm also the co-chair of this year's convening. So my name is Shona Chakravarti. I'm with the Hill Snowden Foundation and I'm also an NFG um, board member and uh, co-chair of NFG's um, conference, which is now all virtual. And I've been a member for, I think, over 20 years. I am so terribly sad that I cannot be in the same room with all of my NFG colleagues this June. Shona and I were very much looking forward to welcoming you to Washington, D.C. And given that this was a homecoming celebration, we were very much looking forward to getting to play the roles of homecoming queens. So although we can't be together in person, we are together in spirit, and I hope that you'll enjoy our first ever virtual convening. I had actually been a member of NFG back in the 1990s when I was a senior program officer at the Toledo Community Foundation. Then I became re-engaged when I began working at the Need More Fund in 2004. I got involved with NFG through, um, through the conference, actually, and I was actually uh, recruited or invited uh, by uh, what was then called the Working Group on Labor and Community Partnerships, which is now uh, Funders for Just Economy. I got my first job in philanthropy in the mid-2000s. I worked as a program officer at the New York Foundation, funding grassroots community organizing and power building groups in New York City. In NFG, I found a network of other new POs of color that helped me navigate philanthropy. And I found a place that valued centering and following the leadership of grassroots leaders. Um, in NFG, I found a place that valued my lived experience and welcomed me. I really received a lot of important political education. NFG really helped give me this sort of bigger bird's eye view and uh, a greater perspective. Um, I really, um, look back with you know great respect respect um, to some of the founders of um, the working group who played really an instrumental role in informing my my thinking and understanding of what it meant to be a social justice uh, funder um, in those days going back to the 1990s it really was an organization that was all about programming and activities around neighborhood development type of work. So I've kind of watched the shift over the years of NFG moving in a more um, focused programmatic um, direction around the issues of justice and equity that I care about. I know that a lot of folks uh, along the years call NFG their political home. And in the years that I got involved in the mid-2000s, there was an organizing push to bring more of a community organizing power building lens to NFG's work in place. And to me, that organizing space, that space to sharpen my political analysis and find co-conspirators co was key to finding my role in philanthropy. I want to see uh, a philanthropy that is more democratic, uh, that engages uh, folks closer to the grassroots, um, in developing the solutions 
to the problems that are affecting their neighborhoods and their communities and in fact the entire country. I mean, and I hope NFG will also be a leader along this line of thought. I hope and have aspirations for philanthropy that we uh, listen, really listen and follow the leadership of uh, Black, Indigenous and uh, POC staff, like truly. Uh, looking back in terms of 40 years uh, and lessons learned from philanthropy that we haven't funded for the long haul for the next generations. Um, you know, we've been talking with our staff and with members um, about how this we haven't reckoned with this country's history of slavery of black people and genocide of indigenous people. Uh, and that we've been waiting for the metrics versus um, hitting the calls of action um, from black and indigenous leaders. I hope that philanthropy will follow the leadership of foundations like Mary Reynolds Babcock, General Service Foundation, and Hill Snowden, to name a few that are increasing their giving now. I hope that NFG is recognized and continues to be recognized for the important role it's playing in educating funders um, around building a just society. This is really a critical year. 2020 is like is a year like no other. Um, and I think especially the events uh, when George Floyd was killed by police in Minneapolis and the ensuing protests and demonstrations and uprisings that have been occurring uh, not only in the Twin Cities, but throughout the countries, including small towns and smaller cities. I think we really are at a tipping point. Um, I think with the pandemic, the economic crisis, and the political crisis, we don't want things to be the same. We want and deserve better. I think the role of philanthropy is to help widen these cracks to let the light in. It's by centering root cause analysis and power building, uh, by centering intersectional analysis, by creating these organizing spaces uh, where people can find their political home, deepen their analysis. I think NFG is well positioned and um, to meet this moment. And, and I look forward to collaborating with you all uh, to do more and to be bolder. My name is Gladys Washington. I am the <clears throat> former deputy director or newly retired from the Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation based in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Um, and we have been long-term members uh, 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 of NFG. NFG is relational. Um, and so coming from a small family foundation that works across 11 states that was talking about the South was um, hard to do 20 years ago. We talked publicly about the impact of racism and, and the debilitating of impact, impact of poverty on the Southern region. We had very few philanthropic partners in the South that did the same. Um, and so we found a community where we could be in relationship with funders who um, challenged us, but most mostly believed the same things that we did. And so they became co-funders of work in the South. Um, that hard work that we were doing, uh, working with grass, grassroots organizations and Black-led organizations, we talked about how people work across those lines of differences in places where racism was so stark. Um, the Southern U.S., we found a home at NFG. It is interesting to me, and that is that it is celebrating its 40th year in this time, in this moment, with a um, 
a global pandemic, but certainly one here in the United States that has stricken um, more people of color and black people, that um, we're uh, in the midst of a time when um, black life um, is not valued and is taken um, quickly. Um, and in the absence of national leadership, that there is a mandate now for NFG um, on creating opportunities for philanthropy to be able to come together in ways that has not come together before, to ask itself, to turn the mirror on itself um, and understand how much um, philanthropy has been a part of white supremacy and to step into how it begins to think and act differently and support grassroots organizations and support people of color-led organizations to create change. Philanthropy has not always been transparent about what it learns. As philanthropic institutions have to be honest about that because um, philanthropy believes many times that it's right when oftentimes that's in an echo chamber rather than um, with the people who are in communities who are trying to build that power. Sharing power means building power. And so I can throw rocks. And I'm okay with throwing rocks um, because I stand in my own truth about, and always have, about the limitations of philanthropy um, because it did not look at itself and it did not learn well. Um, and when we don't learn well, money is wasted, power is not built, People are still disengaged and harmed um, when philanthropy does not learn what it needs to learn. And so I think that um, that's one of the things we've learned and are still learning um, about how change happens and how philanthropy behaves uh, when it comes to power. Um, I believe that we, um, we in philanthropy you know, all of us have all these degrees and stuff. I got a couple too. Do I remember what they're in? No. Do I know how to build a house? Do I understand how to um, to build power on the ground? Do I understand what organizing is and civic engagement is? Do I understand what um, uh, uh, a GOTV strategy looks like? I do, but I learned it from the people who do the work. Again, we got to learn. Philanthropy has to continually learn from people who do the work and share power. Um, and I, I think maybe that's the biggest lesson that philanthropy has learned and has to still step into. Because in this moment, something is needed that's different for philanthropy right now. That it learns and it uses its money in a way that helps to dismantle um, white supremacy and advance um, social, um, economic, and political justice. It has to share power differently, but in order to do that, um, it has to examine itself internally and be honest about what it sees, about the origins of the money. Um, much of philanthropy, as, as we know, um, has been uh, accrued on the backs of particularly black people in this country. When folks started redlining in communities um, where you, you couldn't buy a house or that that house was underwater before you bought it um, or where um, urban renewal meant that you built a road in the middle of a community and broke it up in ways that um, made it at the end of the day poorer than the, at the heart of that is racism. We got to get to racism in a real granular way very quickly so that all those other things change, right? Um, because it's, an, it's, it's integrated. Um, and in part, um, philanthropy has had a, has played a role in some of it, right? And so philanthropy got to come up out of that. Philanthropy collectively has to look different. What I am suggesting is that it be a collective uh, philanthropic response that shows up with its, its money um, and its people 
differently than it ever has before. Folk got to lean in. We've seen some of that with COVID. Now we're we're into something else. Keep leaning in. Keep putting that money out. Um, and so much is of, of philanthropy's resources are tied to the market, of course. And I'm saying, forget the corpus. Put the money where it needs to go so that we have the possibility of changing some things. So we can change the national paradigm, the national and the local paradigm, because we need all of it to shift. It's all crazy. Um, so I just think philanthropy has an opportunity now to show up differently, collectively. NFG has a history now of action with the Amplify Fund, um, you know, democratizing development, um, all of those things, um, philanthropy forward, supporting grassroots organizations, pulling together that um, infrastructure collectively um, in this moment so that that money hits the ground quickly. It's no more thinking about it. It's no more sitting around talking about how it, go, how it will, will hit the ground based on some sort of strictures and structures that philanthropy creates. It is, let's do this thing as quickly as we possibly can um, so that we can make a difference. NFG has the opportunity to pull that, to, to help to pull some of, some of those resources together um, and can help to devise ways that that can get out and be deployed very quickly. And we will be guided by um, the people who do the work on the ground as to how that, that, that money um, supports folks. We have to trust people to do that. We have to assume that it will be used the, in, in the best ways that it can possibly use, be used for those organizations. And so it's being honest about that and what that means. It is, um, it is looking at itself and saying we will do more um, that, than the 5% that's required legally, um, that we will do more and we will do it um, honestly and openly. My call to action to philanthropy is this is to, um, one, show up in this time in a collective way. Two, is to look at itself, put a mirror upon itself, and be honest about what it sees. Three, is to um, use the capacity, the wisdom of people who do this work Stop requiring that for, stop requiring that everybody um, is judged on the, the, it, by the same yardstick when context matters in different places across this country. Um, and to advocate with philanthropy, that's five. And number six is dig into that corpus. Create your vo use your voice to um, change what that legislation looks like. Use your voice to be in alliance with um, people of color-led organizations around uh, issues and priorities that make sense for them in the places in which they do it. Ha. Ah. So, hi everybody, I'm Kevin Ryan. I'm the NFG class of 2002. And I have the honor and privilege of coming to you live from Detroit, Michigan. You know I had to get Detroit in to this somehow. And I also have the honor and privilege to, to start the conversation with our amazing plenary speakers. So I'm gonna start with Ashley Woodard Henderson, the co-executive director of Highlander Research and Education Center. And I want to start, Ashley, um, by asking you, how has Highlander Center's work evolved over the years? And what does that work look like now, the, now given this current black, uh, movement for Black Lives? Thanks so much for the question, Kevin. Uh, first of all, would just also echo gratitude to the NFG crew. Uh, love to Adriana and would say to all of you, who so passionately and so excellently represent NFG, uh, 40 years young looks very good on you. Uh, in regards to Highlander's work, 
I would say that we've been doing pretty much the same thing since 1932. Um, at 90 years young, we are a sanctuary uh, for colleagues and comrades all over the United States, but particularly with a Southern focus uh, to find rest, to find recovery, to find respite, to develop strategies, to become excellent in our methodologies, to learn different tactical interventions from each other. And as much as it's important that we are a school that makes smarter people come together to get even sharper in how they understand what's happening in the moment and what they could do about it, the most important piece of that work is to make sure that they have the resources and tools at their availability to take that new knowledge that could only happen sitting in those rocking chairs and take that information home to do something to change their material conditions with it. What Highlander is is a catalyst for social movements. We have been and we will continue to be. Who we are is a collective of individuals and organizations all across the region who come together to make sure that we are a company movement and supporting movement to win. We are also an organization that believes in our DNA that as goes the South, so goes the nation and the world. We are an organization who, that because of that incredible work has survived decades worth of attacks and blowback from white supremacists and from the state. Um, and so who Highlander is, is alive and well and doing the work to build up the 21st century generational cohort of folks that will be not only the folks that envision, but actually implement the work of building the 21st century Southern freedom movement. Why does that matter in this movement um, moment? Well, I think for a couple of reasons. One is because the movement for black lives would not exist if it weren't for incredible radical legacies of the black organizing tradition in the United States. Um, and very contemporarily, if it wasn't for the leadership of folks like myself and Mary Hooks, who are on the call, and an incredible cohort of Southern leaders who are also making the work of the Movement for Black Lives sustainable on a daily basis. Who is the Movement for Black Lives, you might be asking? Well, I'm glad. I'd love to tell you. We're a coalition, again, of 21st century Black liberation movement organizations who together are making possible what would have been impossible if we had only taken forth these efforts as individuals or individual organizations. Even the things that we're demanding right now would have been things that even some of our colleagues potentially on the call would have said are impossible just three weeks ago. It is time in this moment to divest from the systems that harm our people and to invest deeply like we want Black people to win. This is the moment, y'all. This moment came at too high of a cost. It should not have cost this much cumulative Black death to get us to this moment. This is a moment that might feel familiar for all too many of us. These might be familiar muscles that we're flexing in regards to making sure that our people are taken care of and have the resources at their disposal to be not only able to respond rapidly, but to be able to recover and to prepare for the oncoming onslaught of attacks against them. What we should know now is that with the intersecting crises that our people are surviving right now, whether that's COVID-19 or police brutality and white supremacy, or immigration injustices, et cetera, that this is a moment where we are all at risk and it is going to take all of us on deck to make sure that our people not only can survive this moment, but get to moments of thriving. What we know is that we are experiencing public lynchings every day and that now is the time to do something about it. We are winning and we are under attack. This is a moment where our transformative relationships, our commitment to doing that is time to practice them. This is the moment where those transformative relationships can not only transform us in the service of our people, but can transform communities and organizations, this country and the world. This is a moment where funding transformative grassroots work like you want us to win could actually make all the difference. At 40 years old NFG, you're good and grown and it is time to act like it. This is a moment where Vincent Harding would have reminded us that a new America still needs to be born and that we are the midwives to do it. This is a moment, NFG, where you can know your role and play it excellently in service of targeted communities all across this country and globe. This is the moment where all of our intellectually stimulating conversations about what should be happening in philanthropy, are. it's now the moment to get to the doing of the difference. This is the moment where you should be resourcing the most directly impacted organizations led by the most directly impacted individuals and the most directly impacted communities to do everything in their power, using every tactic in our tactical toolbox to do every opportuni opportunistic strategy that will win. This is the time, y'all. This is our moment. 
And so I am proud to be a grassroots supporter of the incredible work that has been happening, this political home that's been built with NFG. And now is the moment in which I think we can actually put the, the intellectual stimulating conversations that we had to work in order to change the material conditions of our people so that we never have to get to this point of cumulative black death again. This is our moment and I'm excited to be in solidarity and a transformative right relationship with you all as we continue to do the work to see our people liberated in our lifetime. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Um, and I just want to make sure everybody knows you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen as you have questions that come in. And when we conclude our uh, initial round of, of questions, we'll, we'll turn it over to you all and we'll, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. So thank you for that powerful opening, Ashley. Now I want to turn it over to Mary Hooks, the co-director for Southerners on New Ground or Song. And I'm going to ask the same question to you, Mary. How has Song's work evolved over the years? And then what, what does it look like now, given this current Movement for Black Lives leadership moment? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I echo what Ashley said. What a blessing to be able to share this virtual space with you all and celebrate 40 years strong. Um, and thank you all so much for um, what I would say is, you know, been leading the charge, if you will, on the ways in which um, philanthropy can be in right relationship with uh, grassroots organizing. Um, you know, I think I work for Song as a 28-year-old uh, institution here in the South. Um, one of the things that I believe has made us um, able to withstand the trials and tribulations of, um, of doing work over a long period of time is that we've been able to uh, be flexible and be able to pivot and uh, be clear, but never change our values, never change the vision, but also um, be willing to chart new paths when required and when we see it's necessary. And, you know, this uh, last year has been um, a whirlwind and I would air to actually, I'd say 2020, because this felt like a whole year within itself when we're only like halfway in, you know. Um, and a lot of our work um, continues to center the lives of black and brown, queer and trans, working class, you know, uh, rural uh, folk in the South and queer Southerners who um, understand that our role inside of broader liberation movements is to bring um, not just our queer flair, but also a black queer feminist politic uh, to the conversation and the ways in which we organize and the ways in which uh, we do our work. And I think that in the midst of all the crises that are killing black people, and there are so many, um, but if we just think about COVID, cops, courts, and cages, uh, we know that there is much work to be done and much work that, uh, you know, we've had to pivot around to make sure we're meeting not just the needs of, of our folks' material needs, but also um, making the political interventions that are crucial to advancing the liberation struggle. And I think uh, these last few months, we've certainly seen um, our folks, you know, shift. We've seen our folks shift when we begin to see that even the tattered social safety nets that many of us were, and many of us in this country experience, begin to um, fold given that COVID begin to shut down critical uh, human services. We begin to see a lot of our folks in chapters begin to organize around mutual aid and understanding that we are each other's harvest, magnitude and bond, right? And we also saw as um, our work has been squarely centered on advancing the vision of abolition, um, primarily through ending pretrial detention, that this was a moment also for us to be able to call for what was, you know, seen as the impossible when we said, yo, you need to free everybody, everybody, and to keep people held in cages would be a death sentence. And so our work um, began to expand in terms of what we were calling for um, in the midst of COVID incarceration. I also, um, you know, this last month or so, it's been, um, you know, one of these movement moments, and you know, like Ashley said, many of us have uh, weathered this storm before, if you will. And I think that we have had the blessing of being able to harvest the lessons of previous uprising moments to be able to, um, you know, absorb more people into organization, understand the difference between rapid response and long term strategy, and also uh, to deepen our alignment with um, our comrades and other folk 
engage in this work and be able to identify new opportunities to build. And I think um, one of the things that has been such a, a, a joy to be a part of is Song um, taking up leadership inside of the Movement for Black Lives and seeing that body of work continue to advance. And, you know, we're in a different moment in a different conversation than we were in 2014, you know, and it's, um, you know, beautiful to be a part of work that I feel like I was looking at some old articles the other day and I was like, yo, we've been talking about this. We've been talking about defunding the police. We've been talking about divesting from our communities and investing in our folks' lives. And I think um, we're tired of saying the same thing, real talk. And I also think that uh, because of the level of alignment and power we've been able to build uh, and the narrative that we've been able to push for those years, it has certainly brought this country uh, to a tipping point in terms of, you know, who are we trying to be? You know, it's decision-making time. Um, and what is it that we want? And do we just want piecemeal uh, crumbs or do we actually want uh, revolutionary change and transformative change? And are we willing to chart a path that'll get us there? And so I think um, what this also indicates is that uh, in as much, most of us, we know we, we work to organize ourselves out of a job and we know that, um, there is much work as we call for the defunding of police that also needs to happen. And so I believe that a big part of our work as we continue to um, pivot and to make strategic interventions that we also have to, um, that we also have to prepare to build and we also have to be preparing ourselves to win. Um, and so that means for what I, when I think about that, I'm like, yo, we have to not just invest in the policy fights, but we also have to be doing deep investment work in new experiments, in new models, um, because that is what's going to be, and that is what is being called for. And so um, just super grateful. I'm, a, I'm not going to keep rambling, but just super grateful for um, the blessing to be able to be in movement in this time, to see you all as movement comrades who are also in struggle for a liberation that um, far exceeds all that we could imagine and hope for in this time, and just want to compel everyone to um, you know, take risks that is worthy of the courage of our people who are risking their lives in the streets, who are being uh, arrested in tear gas for the families who are still grieving and mourning for the um, possibility, um, for the possibility of what's on the other side. And when we you know, celebrate 80 years of, of NFG, we can um, you know, also be clocking not just the policy wins, but also the new world we've built together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Now, I'm going to ask all of uh, Ashley and Mary to, to, to join me, as well as Gladys Washington, the former deputy director at the Reynolds Babcock Foundation and uh, longtime NFG leader and mentor and supporter to join us. And uh, Gladys, I'd love to um, ask for give you some space to to respond to what you heard from from mary and from ashley first of all i want to um, give a shout out to all my former colleagues at nfg and say congratulations to you for 40 years now i'm kind of stalling because who can follow those two sisters but i'm gonna try my southern sisters i'm gonna try um and and do that um they bring so much wisdom to the work. And I appreciate it because they challenge um, both themselves and folks in communities and philanthropy around the issues that are most important and critical during this time. And I am grateful um, for their work because they tell the truth all the time as they see it, they, they bring it wherever they go. I am grateful. Um, for them and the work that they do around movement building um, in, in the South and across this country. Um, you have had some amazing impact and I am again grateful to you. Um, that's sort of my response to them. I can't add anything. They, they are uh, perfect spokespeople for themselves. I just want to say something to philanthropy. Can I do that, Kevin? Absolutely, you can do what you, you need to do. All right, that's what I'm talking about. I think that we at NFG have been comfortable 
um, and most foundations have been comfortable with supporting advocacy and organizing and movement building. But the issue of power has to be addressed or change will not happen. And so when I talk about power uh, as it relates to philanthropy, I'm talking about something that's a novel idea. Not really, because there's some folks doing it. But it's about participatory philanthropy. That's both at the grant, on the grant making side and on the investing side. And as I said in the video, you know, philanthropy needs to do some soul searching, um, especially uh, in reaction to the movement for black lives, the movement for racial justice, um, that is questioning institutions of power. Well, these are institutions of power too, right? And so what do we do now that, uh, my friend Derek Johnson said something there in The Guardian uh, at the NAACP, he said, we need to be moving from protest to power to policy. I'm talking about that piece in the middle, power, right? And so um, philanthropy has a lot of power. So how does it cede some of that power for, to the folks who are working in communities, who are facing struggles every single day about what they need, how they need it, and how philanthropy shows up in the work? I think it is through participatory grant making. Now we have examples of that, but it's just a few over the years. I think we need to grow that pot. I think NFG is, is, is a place that's possible for that to happen. For example, you've got folk like the Zaro Families Foundations in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who have just created a racial justice fund that will be, um, that's, that's to support uh, the communities and it's in commemoration of the Tulsa race, race riots. These folks in those communities will decide where that money goes to the organizations in those communities. We need to, push ourselves to do more of that work. Philanthropy showed up with COVID. I think, again, there's an opportunity to show up in a different way to change that power dynamic and put some of that power in the hands of, of the people who do the work, who struggle every day, and who die for the work. I think that there's an opportunity, too, for investment um, changes. Um, Heron is doing some work around this. Um, how how do, do folks and communities show up around how Philanthropic money is invested in how it makes money. I think there's opportunity here for that to happen. Um, but that's just me talking. Uh, I'm not in philanthropy anymore. I can talk all the stuff I want to talk. Um, but I think it, um, it makes a whole lot of sense. If we want to create change in this moment, this, these are some of the things we need to think about doing. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Glass. And I, I want to start with some of the, the questions that are coming in now. So I want to start with the first question is, the reality of it is that philanthropy for many years has failed Black communities. And many Black leaders, I talk to leaders all the time in Detroit who have no faith in institutional philanthropy, no trust in institutional philanthropy. And all these funders, of course, now everybody's come out of Woodwork saying they're going to do exactly what you said, Glass. We're going to set these things up. We're going to do these things. But there's no trust there because people may have made these kind of commitments before, have failed before, intentionally or not, have failed. So how do we actually build trust now going forward? Because we've been here, as you, and Mary, you, and Ashley, you, you both have said we've been here before. And people have made promises before. So how do we make sure this time is actually different so the philanthropy actually lives up to these promises that all these people are, are making? Mary, you want to jump in? You want me to go? You go for it, buddy. Uh, so, I mean, I, my grandmama taught me that building trust is doing what you said you were going to do over and over and over and over again. And when you mess it up, it means not starting the next day like you didn't know what you were supposed to do when you messed it up, right? Um, and so what I would offer is that movements are consistent. We've been making social change possible for as long as, as Black people and otherwise targeted and marginalized communities have been in this country. Um, so I, I don't know that there's much more than keep winning with, with minimal resources that we, can do, that we can do to prove to philanthropy that the way that change happens is by deeply investing in us, right? Yeah. We've done our work. This is not a pitch call, right? 
this is a moment where philanthropy has the opportunity to be like, you know what, movement, y'all been doing the damn thing. Appreciate you. Now, what, like, what are you willing to do to earn our trust and to keep our trust and to be consistent in a trust building exercise with us, right? And I think it goes back to what, of course, I mean, what's real is we follow Gladys um, and what she already told you is that the way to do that is to invest in power building work. Right? That doesn't mean just give to the, the stuff that see, seems easy, right? To the organizations that are white led, that you know, have a lot of visibility, that are doing all of, uh, you know, uh, taking a lot of credit and proximity to the grassroots work that folks like Mary is doing down in Atlanta and across the South, the work that folks like BYP 100 are doing, the folks that like, like BLM, other organizations that are doing Dream Defenders that are doing Power You, all these incredible organizations that are actually on the ground grinding every day that are getting pennies to the dollar of what some of these big national organizations are getting, right? So the way that you can earn our trust is by actually being in communication with us. Like if the process is participatory, then you already know what we think and mm -hmm. the way to respond to what we think becomes super clear, mm -hmm. right? I wanna raise just a couple of things in regards to like, what can you do to earn my trust, to earn the trust of folks like Mary Hooks, to earn the trust of other grassroots leaders that are on the ground in the South and across this country. The first thing you can do is you cannot put us in a position where we're debating about whether or not we're taking rapid response money or recovery money. You should give us both, right? You should give us both because not only are we responding to the immediate crises, we're also preparing for the others that are on the way. So let me be clear, when COVID hit, Mary and I were already doing everything in our power to make sure Southerners were protected because it was tornado season. When the shelters in place dropped and COVID became a reality that was putting more and more of our people into unemployment, people that were already living in states where governors had not expanded Medicaid, we were dealing with folks in Tennessee and Nashville um, and in Eastern Tennessee and across the Gulf South who were literally having to find places to go because their homes had been destroyed by tornadoes, right? So we were, there, there was already an intersecting crisis there, right? And then on top of that, we have a public lynching happening every day. Every 28 hours, a black person in this country is murdered by a police officer, a vigilante, or a security guard, right? So these multiple intersecting crises are already real for marginalized and targeted communities. So we not only need to be dealing with the immediate impacts of those, we also need to be preparing for the next thing. And even if the next thing isn't a crisis, because I do think you could fund us in a way that, that precludes any more crises. That actually could happen, right? It's, it's truly up to you. You truly could fund us like you want us to win so that this stuff never happens again, right? But if you don't, and the next crisis is coming, then what you could do is believe us when we tell you right now. Let me tell you the consequence of what happens when you don't. When you don't believe us when we say right now, right, on Tuesday, June, what is it, June 30th in this year of our Lord 2020, right? I just want to remind some of my colleagues on this call that when in, you know, 2018, we were saying that there was a rise in white supremacists and white nationalist attacks in this country. We were seeing black churches be bombed and people were like, oh, you know, we should do some symbolic gesture. Um, when folks were making us choose between whether or not to increase digital security and making sure that we were doing mutual aid and community defense work, when that choice had to be made in March of 2019, Nazis burned down my administrative office, right? Mm -hmm. And then we had to be in rapid response mode and I was spending much more time talking to philanthropy than I was doing the organizing to make sure that our people were safe, right? So I think that it is critically important in this moment where organizations are literally holding everything together on their own to be able to meet the needs of grassroots communities in regards to the impact of these intersecting crises that are disproportionately impacting people that look and live and love like me and Mary. Right. If you fund us like you want us to win, it means supporting us in those recovery efforts and supporting us in the rapid response. The second thing that I would say, and I'm pulling this from the brilliant Takima Robinson, who said this first, is like, what grant report would you require of Rosa Parks? What grant report would you, what, 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 what proposal would you want Malcolm X to give you to prove that the work that he was doing was radical enough to transform the world? What kind of what kind of like conference call would be needed to check in on the work with a John Lewis, an Andrew Young, a Septima Clark, a Dorothy Cotton? Because let me tell you that the people that I'm working with right now are those people. This is our 50 year moment. And if we are spending more time convincing you all to be good advocates on our behalf, 
then you are taking away from our capacity to be able to actually build the movement building power that Gladys was speaking to earlier. So I'd, I'd ask you to, in your self-reflection, and I don't want you to self-reflect long, y'all have had 40 years to be self-reflected. Um, I want you to do something, right? What does this moment require of you to do something differently to actually create the, the conditions in which people can win? So the last thing that I'll say, and then I'll shut up so my comrades can get in, is like, this is the moment, y'all. This is it, like I said earlier. And I'm thinking about what Tanisha McHarris has said to so many of you, that now is the moment to figure out what rules can you break? What norms can be superseded for the sake of liberation in our lifetime? Anything less than that, comrades, is a cop-out. Anything less than that is not doing our due diligence to do everything in our power, literally everything in our power, to know our roles and play them excellently for the sake of the liberation of our people in this time. So that's what I think you could do. That's why I think movement building and power building is so important. And I'm excited to be in, in a transformative relationship with you as peers, as equals, uh, to make sure that we're being accountable to each other to ensure that that happens. Hell, hell, Mary I'm uh, glad. Oh, there we go. I was going to say, I'm moved and I'm, <laughs> I'm compelled. I'm like, shoot, I give, I pay my membership dues inside of Saul, but Lord, I want to give some more. Um, but I think everything that Ashley said, um, I was, I think I've um, kind of moved to tears right now because um, I literally feel an angst um, where I know that this work, I want to celebrate with y'all. I want to celebrate with y'all. And I'm also like, I have work right now, other work, other work that I must prioritize. Um, and so I'm always like grappling of like, how do I spend my time? Um, and it would be, um, it would be, so I'm just holding that. And I think that um, I'm curious about how folks are resetting their priorities right now. Um, how are we spending our time? Uh, what are the challenges we're willing to take on? What are the other relationships that have not yet been cultivated that needs to be cultivated? Who is not yet getting resources? What are the leadership that isn't being funded, you know, that needs to be invested in? And I think that um, in the midst of so much happening and, you know, when COVID hit, it was so many questions on like, yo, um, uh, new fund funders aren't gonna be taking on new uh, grantees because, Everything's a little wobbly and in un the uncertainty. Um, but I need folk to ride out that uncertainty um, because there are too many people who are doing extremely necessary and critical work that need resources. And they may, may never have gotten those resources before, but this isn't the time to, uh, to shut the doors. This is the time to open them up wider. And uh, I know that that's, you know, that's the word on the street. I could be wrong. That's what I'm hearing the way philanthropy is, you know, responding to this moment. And that's not helpful. And uh, one of the ways in which, um, you know, Ash and uh, a bunch of other our comrades here in the South was like, yo, we need to uh, move a strategy that's going to get the South resource because it's already under resource. Lord have mercy. This crisis will take many institutions and organizations under. And so um, we feel our obligation and we hope that you all feel that same level of obligation to figure out how to be more expansive, to, to make sure more, um, more institutions, small organizations are able to um, get resources and not have to crawl for it and not have to crawl for it. Unacceptable, unacceptable. And I feel like, um, you know, there are folk that I know who are inside of philanthropy and are on movement assignment. Many of you all have left the front lines and have come into philanthropy, and I just want to honor what it means to do that, what it means to do that level of work, because um, I know it's not easy. And um, just want to honor that I know that there are folks going to the mat really hard for us. And so I think that, um, you know, if, if anything, if this uh, moment, if the last few weeks of this year, um, you know, hasn't shown us, the, the big us, that um, it is not the piecemeal, it is not the crumbs. We're looking for all right, you know, um, transformation and nothing less will do and nothing less will do. And I think all of us um, are better on the other side of it, of course, but um, challenge, we have to challenge each other to, uh, to act now, 
to act now. Um, yeah, I, I have no more to say about that. Thank, thank you both again for your, for your comments. Um, I, I have a direct question for you, Mary, and let me get to it here. Um, can you talk about the development of the mandate, the origin story and the central focus in this moment? Yeah, um, you know, spirit put it on my heart. And I will start by saying too that uh, Song has been begging the question since the, the time of our elders that started Song 28 years ago on um, and begging the question of us as comrades, are you willing to be transformed in the service of the work? And that is that question is raised, rather it is in conflict, rather that is in how we wanna sharpen our, our growth edges, how we want to continue to decolonize in all the ways. Are you willing to allow the transformative work that we do penetrate you enough where you are also being changed and not just being a doer of change work, but also manifesting change within yourself and uh, becoming the change we wanna see in the world. And um, so Spirit put that on my heart um, around, but there was, some, there was something else for black people. I remember sitting in, my, um, sitting in my living room and I believe in this very chair that I'm sitting in years ago. And I said, there is something else for black people. And ancestor Spirit said, that the mandate for black people in this time is to avenge the suffering of our ancestors, to earn the respect of future generations and to be willing to be transformed in the service of the work. And there are many ways in which people um, have, you know, hear that mandate and it hits differently for different people. And when I hear that, I know that um, I'm always clear about the relationship to black people in this country Right. In the words of Asada Shakur, Black people aren't citizens of this country. We're victims of this country. And so, yes, um, I'm, I am deeply, deeply aware of our relationship to this, to this colonizer in the U.S. empire. And so, yes, I am still mad about what they've done to my foremothers. I am still mad. And I know that. And so that fuels my righteous anger. But what it also does is reminds me of the resilience of our people and that avenging their suffering is also about um, Black joy. It's very much about Black joy and being able to engage in, um, in joy and pleasure and love in the way in which many of our people had not had the opportunity to do so. Um, and making sure that, you know, um, in an in, in a African-centric focus, we think about Sankofa, how to think about seven years before and seven years ahead. Um, in terms of future generations and considering those who've come before us. And so when we begin to, when we do work, when we say we want to do change work, it has to be uh, something that honors the people that have come before us and also honors those who will come after us. And so uh, what we do, what we leave, how we document it, how we, um, you know, lay out, you know, our thinking and what would our freedom dreams so that future generations will know, because we know this is a protracted struggle. It won't, we won't live a racial happen in my lifetime for sure, but that fight will always be ongoing. And we owe it to uh, future generations to be able to um, hand over a body of work, of lessons, of honest truth telling and assessment of what worked, what didn't, you know. Um, and then again, uh, and going back to the transformation part, like all of us, all of us, if this work does not change who we are, um, if it does not make us sweeter, if it does not make us more brave, if it doesn't make us more uh, loving and, and have more of a generosity of spirit, then we're doing something wrong. If it doesn't, you know, broaden our expansiveness on the possibilities of liberation and who should be included in that liberation agenda. If it doesn't, um, you know, deepen our, our commitment to be anti-racist and to address anti-blackness and capitalism and patriarchy then we're not doing it right. And so um, that is the mandate that keeps me up late at night and wakes me up early in the morning. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. Thank, thank you, Mary. Uh, I wanted to get this question in. A couple of people have actually raised this. Um, what comes to mind is the strength and interconnectedness of indigenous sovereignty and black liberation. How we show up for one another and how philanthropy shows up for this movement will be the catalyst that perpetuates the change that we've been working on since the inception of this country. 
going forward, how do we continue to show up for all of our relatives? Yeah, I mean, I think it's simple. It's like, don't use your philanthropic positionality to pit us against each other. <laughs> That's, it's, not, it's not that difficult. There's a long legacy of Black Indigenous, well, one, I'd say a couple things. One is that Black, black people and Indigenous people can sometimes be in one body. Um, so one, I, I wouldn't lean into false dichotomies. But I would say, in general, for Indigenous to Turtle Island communities and Black communities that are not also Indigenous, um, what I would offer is that there's a long legacy of radical tradition of solidarity between our communities. Uh, whether that was literally the abolitionist movement uh, that ended you know, slavery as we knew it uh, in the 1800s, or if it was as, as recent as like Standing Rock and, and the movement for Black Lives, rocking and kicking it together. Um, when I think about some of what happened on Juneteenth was incredible solidarity between Black communities, and Indigenous communities. That's not a new practice for us. So what I would say is fund all of us. Like you want us to win. It's the same, it's gonna be a broken record. Um, is that if we know that the South in particular is a huge territory that includes the majority of Black people and a significant portion of, of Indigenous nations, uh, whether that's the Homa Nation down in, uh, in the Gulf South that have been fighting for sovereignty for years, um, or, you know, I include Oklahoma in the South and the comrades that have been turning up together across Black and Indigenous communities in regard to, to what's been happening in Tulsa as of late. This is an opportunity uh, to fully resource that. And when I talk about fully resourcing, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about just making the commitments that you've made for this fiscal year. I'm talking about doing that and some, right? Because what we know is that only 4% of philanthropic dollars are coming to this region altogether, right? And so if we're having to split that between the most targeted communities in the largest geographic region in the U.S., uh, then the, re the responsibility of philanthropy is to actually do better, to do more. Right, and what, what it means to be doing that in a moment of, of increasing crises that are intersecting and disproportionately impacting indigenous communities who are also impacted by police brutality, who are also impacted by the crisis of capitalism, who are also impacted uh, because of, of gender-based violence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, just like black communities, then it's incumbent of philanthropy to actually do more and abundantly more of what was offered in this in this season, uh, you know, before we got to these intersecting crises. So, you know, I believe that the way that we make sure that we're doing work that centers all of our relatives is to recognize that anti-blackness isn't good for anybody. It's literally bad for everybody. When black people win, everybody wins. And disproportionately, it's impactful to other communities, <laughs> right? When we want affirmative action, the people that benefited from it most were not just black people, right? So I think the, the point, it's not to, to make false dichotomies between our communities that don't actually exist in practice. Don't make a, 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 a sandbox messier uh, by, by forcing that there's some sort of disconnect that actually doesn't exist. And then fund us to actually come up with, with solutions to the problems that do exist between our communities, right? Mm -hmm. Fund us to actually be able to experiment even if we lose together, we will learn together. And I think if you funded us to be courageous with each other, we would do even more work to make sure that our people win and that nobody gets left behind. Thank you. I'm, I'm, so we have time for one more question. And this one is another one that has come up a few times. We have seen that many young people are also leading the way for transformative change during this moment. Are you all seeing that youth led organizations are being funded and supported on the ground? What are people thinking in terms of uplifting and supporting the work of young people? Yeah, I mean, the, I think the answer to Mary hop in is like, no, they're not getting funded enough. <laughs> they're just not. And I, and I think there's probably multiple reasons for that. I think that there is still real ageism that believes that young people actually don't know how to make good decisions about what social movements should be doing, even though they've been leading the way for centuries. It's young people. Highlander is powerful because our young people demand that of us. They are so much more radical than we are. And they consistently hold us accountable to the to the principles that we preach. They, they fight with us to make sure that we're actually doing what we said we would do. So there's incredible organizations that are doing work. BYP 100 is one of them. Again, Power You, the Dream Defenders. There's incredible folks in our Seeds of Fire program at Highlander that are doing this work. You know, most of the people that I know that keep me accountable as a member of Southerners on a New Ground are people that are younger than me, right? 
So what does it look like to actually invest in youth leadership work, even if it's in autonomous spaces where they're coming up with incredible strategies to win? What I'd also say is that that, that youth organizing infrastructure uh, all too often is under attack because they're the ones that are taking the biggest risks. And second of all, I would say that because we haven't been investing, when by we, I mean y'all, philanthropy, investing in training for these, for these folks, then it's actually keeping them from being able to develop all the tactical excellence in their toolbox to be able to use, right? So if, if you're mad at young people because the only tactic that they're using is direct action, but you're not investing in organizing trainings and political development and all of the other and policy advocacy, all of this work, if you're not investing in them to learn how to do it, then you can't be mad that they're making a way out of no way to do what they can do for the sake of liberation of our people. Um, so I would say, no, they're not getting invested enough in. Yes, there are plenty of them that deserve that investment and have built the infrastructure that is worthy of it right is so worthy of it so that i would say that there's much more that could be done but again it's not at the it's this isn't a, this this is not the divest invest campaign the the invest divest campaign is not about like divesting from black folks and in, investing in indigenous folks or divesting from latinx uh you know immigrant justice work and investing in the young people that's not the that's not we not competing like that we all in this together and if y'all do wrong we all tell each other and we all come in for philanthropy together Right? I see that people keep asking about the Southern Power Fund. That's one example of us saying that enough is enough in terms of letting philanthropy be at the steering wheel of what movements in the South do. We decided with Mary and me and folks at Project South and folks at Alternate Roots and folks at uh, you know all these incredible organizations across the region that we were going to come together to make sure that we put out one clear ask, right? And that we were going to work together to make sure that we were all included and that everybody got some coin. And that's what's happening across these social movements. So in regards to what it looks like to then increase your investment in youth organizing and development, it means don't do it at the expense of all the other incredible work that also needs investing in. There is enough just on this call to invest us to do winning work all together. That's possible. Um, and so again, I think the question becomes not like how do you take from one pot and give to another pot? The question becomes how do you give all the pots directly to movement? and then get out of the way in such a way that it not only increases their capacity to do the work, but that it also builds trust so that they can come back to you and be like, all right, we wanna investigate like trying this thing. What do y'all think? I think there's so much opportunity and desire for movements to do that and be in that kind of a relationship with philanthropy. I think, I think too, um, I think too what I'm seeing is that, you know, for young folk who are newer and like just coming into movement and like, I went to my first protest. <laughs> you know, and those who are like forming organizations right before our eyes and like, you know, um, that many of them don't have, um, they don't have, you know, perhaps the, the information about how to get tapped in and how to get resources. Many, some of them are like, I don't know if we want to see three, you know what I mean? And because there's a history of like, as y'all know, that philanthropy has been shady. Love y'all though, <laughs> but philanthropy been shady. And so they're like, I kind of don't want no parts of it, but also, you know, are looking for and need resources to advance the work they want to do. And what I'm also seeing is that, you know, I, and I could just speak for song, but I know there are so many others who leverage so much of the resources we have to get it done. Babies, what y'all need? Y'all need a space? Y'all need food? Y'all need t-shirts? Y'all need whatever it is. You know what I mean? We will take care of it. Blessings for the general operating, because we will give to our people um, and to give to young people when philanthropy hasn't found out a way to, to make that be so. But I think that, um, you know, there certainly needs to be a way in which um, those younger organizations and, and formations that are coming up, and even those two who are moving in, uh, you know, very creative ways, all the young people that bought the tickets from the Trump rally, <laughs> I'm like, they need money keep doing that you know how do we make sure that they get resources because <laughs> that was real so you know and so and even if they're not moving a ground game i think we have to continue to look at the all the different ways in which folks are organizing both digitally and boots on the ground and we need again we need both we need it all and i think that um that is uh that is the spear of the movement you know the tip and spear of the movement is young people to continue to advance it and i also think that um you know, we need more, um, and I know COVID makes it really tough, but um, there's just so much of a bridging and so much intergenerational work. Like we owe it 
to the young people. We owe it to new um, organizations and institutions to be able to say, here's some historical memory to help you, you know, last long if that's what your intentions are, and to be able to have resources to be able to uh, to do that level of work in this time is critical. And um, and many of the young people, I think there's always an infrastructure question again, because folks like not trying to be a C3, but here's our cash app. Venmo us, you know what I mean? Organizations are functioning from like Cash App and Venmo. Like, how does philanthropy meet that moment? How do y'all meet that, yo? You know? And so I think that that's where some um, different creative ways where, you know, folks are going to have to rethink the way we uh, redistribute wealth that actually gets into the hands of folk um, so people can do what must be done. Because all the other red tape stuff, ain't nobody got time to do that right now to set up new C3s and all. Ain't nobody got time for that right now. Folks trying to move, people trying to move work and do good work. Um, and the resources is there, just got to figure out how to get them to them. Thank you, Mary. Uh, as we close out, so we only have a few minutes up. As we close out, I wanted to give um, each of you a chance to, for one final word and the call to, philanth to action for philanthropy. If you wanted to say one final, one final thing as we wrap up. Yeah, I'll, I'll start because um, it's sort of in response to um, Ashley and Mary um, and my colleagues in philanthropy. We are um, we have an opportunity um, in this moment and beyond. I think that um, that philanthropy has to ask itself, how can it show up in the creeping and leaping times? Because we want to show up in the leaping times when things are hot, but we got to show up in the creeping times. Um, when things are not hot and when people are building their capacity, we have to consider what that looks like and what capacity building looks like during those times. I also think that we have to have the mindset that transformative change in this moment is possible, which means that we have to take that message inside the halls of philanthropy and not be scared because it's going to take courage to go inside the halls of philanthropy and say, we got to do something different. We got to figure this thing out. We got to be curious about the young people who are working on the ground. So we go and seek the information rather than, than thinking that they have to bring stuff to us, right, in philanthropy. So again, I think that we have, we've got to think a little bit differently. if We want the results to be different uh, during this time. And we got to risk sometimes our reputational capital in that mix, and we got to risk some of the foundation's capital. Because if, if, if philanthropy is anything, it should be about risk. Thank you, Mary and Ashley. And thank you, NFG. Hey, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Gladys. Um, I just want to say, um, if I could leave you with, with this, is that um, I'm being reminded of Miriam Kaba saying that we need a million experiments right now. We need a million experiments. We need to try new models. Nothing's off the table if it advances the liberation agenda. And I think that part of that means that we have to be willing to fail, but we cannot look back at this time and say we did not give it our all, that we did not try, that we didn't take the risks, that we didn't, you know, put it all on the line. And I think, um, I think that NFG is, um, I feel like, I've seen M NFG take a, you know, uh, take those steps and continue to um, try to move as far left as possible. And so if there is, um, as and many other um, philanthropic comrades, I think that um, y'all are well positioned to be able to do just that um, and to lead the charge, if you will. But this is not a time to be afraid of failure. And this is, um, and, and oftentimes I know people think about taking, you know, the risk factor of funding this work or this work is this a winning strategy is all that sort of mess where I think the real risk um, risk of not um, putting your money on um, directly impacted in black folk and folk who are um, who know what time it is that's the risk of not listening of not doing of not acting of not seizing the moment and seizing the time that's the risk that all of us across the globe We'll have to um, we'll have to look back on and say, my God, how dare how how dare we um, didn't take didn't take the risk necessary to make history and to change history in the course of history. 
So I would just compel you all to get, get ready to fail but, um, and, and fall forward as much as possible, but do it with us because um, we need you. We need you to do that. And we appreciate you, um, you know, positioning yourselves and readying yourselves to do just that. Uh, Miss Gladys, Mary Hooks, I love you with everything I got. Um, yeah, I want to start. I want to pick up when Mary left off. I want to. I want to push you to think about what a risk is, because what I would offer is that the risk that you're navigating right now is continuing to advocate and to heavily resource mediocre work led by undirectly impact, not like not at all impacted people and losing. I think that's the loss. I think that in this moment the risk that you're taking is, is investing and in losing strategies that do not build power or investing in the leadership of Mary Hooks and Southerners on the ground. You can choose to give money to national organizations that aren't connected to the ground, or you could give money to the Highlander Center. You could fund organizing that we know don't work because we've seen it not work for centuries, or you could fund the movement for Black Lives. You could fund the Southern P uh, Power Fund. You could fund so many organizations that are actually on the ground winning. I want to circle that up to something that Ms. Gladys just offered, that cha the transformative change is absolutely possible. We're seeing it right now. You heard Mary talk about all the things that all of a sudden became possible that we had been asking for for decades, that our people had been asking for for generations when COVID hit. They started letting people out of jail. They started, all sorts of stuff started happening. But even, even after that, right, let's talk about the fact that Mary Hooks and Southern is on the ground and the SNAPCO Coalition and all these incredible wor workers and, and organizers and activists on the ground in Atlanta shut down a jail, y'all. Let's talk about Action St. Louis and closing down the workhouse. Let's talk about the fact that like BOP has been working for 10 years and just shut the, the cops out of Oakland schools. Let's talk about the fact that Freedom Inc. just can literally cut their contract with cops in schools in Madison, Wisconsin. Let's talk about the other stepchild of the United States other than the South, it's the Midwest, and they're winning. Let's talk about the fact that this uprising got catalyzed because of the Midwest. Shout out to Minneapolis, who's defunding their police, right? So I, I can not only promise you that, that funding us wins, I can show you. I can show you. You want to know about a multi-tactical strategy that is changing what has been impossible to what is possible? Let me tell you about the movement for Black Lives who even just three weeks ago, people said that defunding the police was a pipe dream and we showed you we could do it. When you said that we were just a bunch of young people that didn't have a vision, we gave you one called the Vision for Black Lives that we're relaunching right now. That's the policy platform that will move us into what Robin D.G. Kelly said could be the third reconstruction, right? Let me show you. Let me show you invest and, be, and, and take, take the actual winning side versus taking the risk of continuing to do the mediocrity and expecting that to change people's material conditions, it will not work. What I would offer you that relationship without works is dead, y'all. Right. Relationship without works is dead. And we cannot continue to allow philanthropy to get credibility and proximity to our radical and visionary and sexy as hell work if you're not gonna fund it like you actually wanna be down. What I want you to ask yourself is what more can we do? This is, a, this is that time. This is not the time where we have the same conversations about the bureaucracy of philanthropy. This is not the moment where we talk about how hard it is to move our trustees and the families to give more money and let us be more rad. We've, we've done that for as long as I've been an executive director and longer. Now is the moment where we identify the role that we as folks on assignment can play wherever your assignment is. We know what role it is. We play it as excellently as we can in service to the liberation of our people that are in marginalized and targeted communities all over this country. This is the time. And so we beg of you and demand of you as folks that say that you're in accountable relationship with our movements to step up and show out. Blow our minds. This is the moment where we get to make heroes out of philanthropy because you did the right thing. Let's do, let's do it, let's get to work. Whew, okay. If, that, if you're not inspired to do something now, something's wrong. And we're going to keep pushing you as we go through this plenary, as we, as we continue to go through the programming. So I just want Ashley, Mary, Gladys, I want to thank all of you. And we appreciate you deeply in the work that you're doing. And we want to thank you, NFG folk members, for showing up today. And let's keep moving this work forward and can keep the conversations going over the next couple of days.